I had 19 attempts of assassination. I had one more since then that makes it 20 attempts of assassination on my life. To me, Christ is real. God doesn't need sissies. He doesn't need wimps. He didn't say pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth loafers. He's looking for warriors who would say for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I would like for every student at Liberty University to hear me loud and clear that I pray every day, Lord, would you please give me the honor to be a martyr for your sake. There are four things which are true in the lives of men and women of God who make a lasting difference in our lives. Number one, they are not motivated by money or possession. Number two, they are not uh, people pleasers. Number three, they are not driven by applause, accolades, and they don't serve God for that. They serve God because they want to honor Lord Jesus Christ who saved them. Number four, they are not afraid of risks, hardships, difficulties, or persecution. I had the privilege of having a conversation with somebody like that who was persecuted and was in the jail for more than 30 days and um, he was humiliated for speaking the truth of the gospel. He survived cancer and yet when we ask him he says that he want to end his life not in a normal way but it would be an honor for him to be chopped off to be beheaded like Paul. Dr. Samuel has done his undergraduate from Columbia International University and he has done his um, BA from Liberty University and he has done his doctorate in divinity from Antioch Seminary. He has also received many honorary doctorates. I hope you will listen to this man and hope this conversation will be an encouragement for you and it will give you a perspective of what a Christian life is, how to live it and what is it to serve God with all our heart, all our mind and all our soul. Listen to this conversation. Dr. Samuel Thomas, thank you so much for uh, coming to our interview. And uh, before I start asking you anything, can you please tell us about yourself, what you are doing, what's your ministry about, a little bit about yourself. Arpana, thank you again for asking me to be on your show. It's a privilege for me. My name is Samuel Abraham Thomas. Uh, pretty much we I'm known by the son of M.A. Thomas, who was a pioneer missionary in Rajasthan. And what I do, I'm an international professional beggar. I beg for those who cannot beg for themselves. With that, I mean, we take care of the orphans, the abandoned, the destitute. We take care of the women who have been burned by the husband. We call the dowry castaway. We take care of the lepers, the blind, the widows. And uh, what we do is try to be the hands and feet and serve the Lord with what we can and bring people and introduce them to the saving knowledge of Christ. And that's what I do mainly. And of course, I'm based out of Kota, Rajasthan, and that is where the headquarters of the ministry is. And uh, mainly taking the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world, introducing as many people to Christ as we can, as long as we can. That's amazing, sir. So coming back to your father, whom you've been talking about, Dr. late Dr. M.A. Thomas, uh, I've heard that there is a very interesting journey that he has been through, like receiving the call of the Lord and how he ended up reaching Rajasthan. Can you just briefly tell us about his journey, like how he accepted the call of the Lord and how he started his ministry back in Rajasthan? You know, his journey actually began in 1959. When he was a student in Hindustan Bible Institute in Madras. And by the way, a lot of Indians have the name Thomas. And thank you for asking the question, why did they have the name Thomas? Not Patel and not anything else. Because the Apostle Thomas was sent to India. That's where he was killed. 
So majority of the Christians that come from southern India, they take the name of Thomas to identify themselves with the Apostle Thomas. So my father, being the oldest in the family of five children, he decided to go to Hindustan Bible Institute. Founder, chairman of that organization was Dr. Paul Gupta. So he came to study there. In 1959, he had to make a decision whether to stay on campus or go home. When I say stay on campus, to take the modular, he had to have 40 rupees. He didn't have it. So in order for him to go home, he had to have money to get on a bus so he could go home and come back on a bus. So guess what? He didn't have that money either. So he found out there was two other men in the Bible college. One was Dr. Philip Abraham, who's still alive, and Dr. Casey John, who went to be with the Lord almost two years ago from Jaipur. So these three men decided to walk home from Madras to Kerala. On 53rd day, they arrived in the city where they were from. I love the way my father used to say, he says, Sam, on Oprah, they tell you if you walk, you lose weight. He says, we walked 53 days and gained 14 pounds. As a result of their walk, many churches were established. Then he came back to the Bible College, finished his degree in 1960. In 1960, of all the people in the world, God would choose Dr. Bill Bright, founder chairman of Campus Crusade for Christ, to be the commencement speaker oh. of his graduation. So Dr. Bill Bright asked Dr. Paul Gupta, he says, do you know of any student that I can consider hiring as the national director for Campus Crusade? He says, you need to consider M.A. Thomas. He just finished 500-mile walk. He takes the gospel every day to the people in Madras. He takes the gospels, distributes the gospels every day. Why don't you consider him? So he called my father, and he says, M.A., I heard about your walk. Would you consider coming and joining us as the national director for Campus Crusade? This was in 1960. It was a pretty good offer coming from the largest Christian organization at that time. And uh, my father says, well, sir, you're only two days behind. I've given my life to serve Christ in northern India, where there's only one Christian for every 10,000 people. So Dr. Bill Wright looked at him and says, are you planning to walk the 1,500 miles? And he said, Yes unless the Lord provides the train fare. Dr. Bill Bright provided the train fare for my father, for my mother, who also was a student in the Bible College. Then the two men, Dr. Philip Abraham and Dr. Casey John, they arrived in the city of Kota, Rajasthan, on 23rd March, 1960. Upon their arrival, they were persecuted. Christians were not popular people in that city, even not even today is the same case. But since God called them, he stayed there. By the way, I like to say this to the listeners. Only in Christian life does obedience require no understanding. A lot of people want to understand God first, then obey him. You will never get to know the joy of the Lord if you understand him first, then obey him. Young people, I encourage you, if you're seeking God to use you, don't try to understand him first. Obey him first. Then he will make you understand what you have obeyed him for. With that said, they came to the city of Kota when they were preaching. One day they threatened him. I love the way when my parents used to say that, Sam, that evening when we went to bed, we went with prayer. Next morning, we were not in heaven. We were still in Kota. So he went out preaching again, started the church. Then eventually, they beat him, broke his skull, put him in prison. God saved people inside the prison. 
With that, the Lord helped him to start the first church. With that one church, there are several thousands of churches established, all by the grace of God. But I'm here to say this to you. Today is 2023. This was done in 1960. The Lord has been faithful every step of the way. I'm glad. Young people, I wish my father was called to Hawaii. I wish he was called to Florida, to Jamaica, not Coda. But God will always call you to get you out of the comfort zone so that you get to know him better, deeper, and get to enjoy his fellowship. That's that's wonderful, sir. That's so wonderful to listen to it. It's so, I mean, there are no words to understand how God uses people who just obey and take God by his word. Sir, your father is a recipient of so many awards like Padma Shri and Mother Teresa and so many other awards. But like you have just told us, as human beings, we don't know our future. We don't know where God is going to take us. Of course, it was so uncertain, but he just, we know that your father and your mother have just trusted the Lord. And I believe that you are also doing the same thing for the ministry to continue forward. What do you want to tell our young people who say that they want to work for the Lord full time or who want to come into the ministry? Because nowadays we see that we need a smooth path and once the stage is set or like everything is set, everything is arranged, then I just want to come and do the work or people are running after name, fame. Nobody wants to go into the suburbs of India. Everybody wants to come into the city and uh, work. What do you want to tell our audience? Sir? Uh, Arpana, good question. First of all, you know, let's start from the word of God. It is so important that you understand what I'm trying to say. A lot of Christians in India and around the world, this is how they read the Bible. They just look and they talk to their wife at the same time. Honey, don't forget to turn the coffee machine on. And of course, the pages are turning. And then they look at the next verse. Did you get the newspaper? And then they're looking at it again. Don't forget that I have a meeting at 10 o'clock. So it's interesting how you can read the word of God and think about coffee machine, think about newspaper, think about things that you have for the day. That's how you know you're not reading the word of God. Devil is disturbing you. I encourage the young people, whoever you may be, wherever you may be, open the word of God, read it aloud. Like, for example, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Read it loud. When you read it loud, you hear it. Mm -hmm. That's what Romans says. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing from the word of God. So first of all, young people, learn to read your Bible loud because your faith comes from hearing the word of God. Number two, whatever God tells you, don't ask him questions. Now, for example, Oh, I don't believe in the virgin birth of Christ. Well, God never asked your opinion whether you believe it or not. The Bible says so, do it. I'll tell you why I believe in the virgin birth of Christ. Because only by the virgin birth of Christ have I been given the privilege to be born again. I will never be born again if Christ was not born a virgin of a virgin. Oh, I will not believe, sir unless the Lord does this. To those smart, intellectual, Christian young men and women, let me say this to you. Since you doubt so much of who God is, and since you doubt if God can do certain things, let me ask you this. When was the last time you were on a commercial airplane? And before you went to your seat, did you have the nerve to stop and ask the pilot to show his license? Have you ever asked the pilot, do you have an experience of flying this airplane? You don't do that. When was the last time you asked a doctor to show his credentials if he's practicing medicine with the right license? You go to a doctor. You don't even know how to pronounce his name. 
On top of that, you can read his handwriting. Number two, you can even prescribe what he has asked you to take. And you take it to a chemist who has a servant who's barely eight past. He looks at the, the, the script written by the doctor mm -hmm. and he gives you a medicine. You don't even know if he's giving you the right medicine. But you have faith in him. You take that. But when it comes to the word of God, well, we are so smart. We want to question God. You know, several years ago, a father brought me to the States when I was going to a Bible college. I'll never forget riding in the car with him. There was a car ahead of us. This is 1984. And we were riding in the car, and I saw a bumper sticker in the front car that said these words. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Now, understand, young people. To me, that was profound. I never seen that. Number one, you don't see those kind of bumper stickers in any Indian car. So I thought everything I see in the U.S. has to be really biblical. It was a Christian nation, blah, blah, blah. I had all this perception in my mind. So I will never forget, I took my Indian pen, because I just arrived from India, and I wrote it down. I said, wow, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Young people, that's the doctrine from hell. It's not from God. God said it. That settles it, whether you and I believe it or not. God has not put us on an approval committee to approve his word. It's the word of God is word of God, whether Sam believes it or not. Mm -hmm. Let me say this to you. I come from India where the Bible is burned the most. You know, the grace, by the grace of God, I have written a few books. Yes. There's, there are some things as an author we like to have. Number one, if you're author of a book, you want people to buy your book. Number two, you will be honored if somebody autographs, ask you for the autograph, you autograph the book. Number three, how you compliment an author, you buy his book, you have him autograph your book, and you read the book. Let me say something to you about the Bible. The greatest way you can ever compliment the Bible is to burn it. Because when you burn it, you're telling me it's working. Mm. It's convicting you. It's changing the way you think. That is why Bible is burned the most. And I'm so glad to be a preacher of the gospel and to say the book that is burned the most is printed the most in the world. No power, no authorities can stop the word of God. And young people, if you are asking God to give you a call, understand this. Christian life is not a career. It's a calling. Calling will always make you feel uncomfortable. You know, Arpana, as we know, that a lot of people in India are now talking about healing. Yes, yes. You know, healing, he'll come to Jesus, he'll heal you. Come to Jesus, he'll do this. You know, I'm a prostate cancer survivor. Five years ago, almost seven years ago, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Had the robotic surgery, had the radiation, all that. Young people, I want you to know this. A lot of orphans and a lot of widows, a lot of believers, a lot of my friends have prayed. Even the doctors prayed. Today, I'm in, we call it, he's in recession. The mm -hmm. cancer is under control. But I want to make sure that we, through this show, tell you one thing. If Jesus of Nazareth did not heal Samuel Thomas of the cancer, he's still God. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just received a temporary healing. Mm -hmm. Whenever you get healing on this planet, it's a temporary healing. Permanent healing is when you go to be with the Lord. Yes. But we all talk about healing. Healing is not gospel. Gospel is healing. Mm -hmm. So don't get into this uh, thing about 
Oh, I don't have the gift of healing. I don't have the gift of prophecy. I don't have, you know what gift you have? Gift that you should have is that God changed your life. Share that testimony. That's the, the greatest thing young people you can do. And like you said, Arpana, a lot of people want to look for a comfortable life. A life that is not requiring too much. That I ask you to not come follow Christ. Mm -hmm. This Christ that I'm talking about, he will make you uncomfortable. He will put you in the storm. So just be aware that Christian life, you know, a lot of people in our country are saying forcible Christians. <laughs> we're forcing Christians. We're forcing people to accept Christ. Ho hum. Let me say something to you. The, the Christ that I'm asking you to follow, he said, the moment you follow, hell will break loose. Storms will come one after the other. Your children will disobey you. Your sons will get on drugs and be addicted to drugs. These are all traps Satan will do to keep you discouraged from following Christ. You come to follow Christ. You look at the 12 disciples except Judas. All 11 became a martyr. You talk about forcible conversion. Let me say something to you. He wants you to follow him with a heart that wants to follow him. I encourage you, read this life of people, the disciples in the Bible. Read biographies of great men and women who followed Christ. And may they be a source of encouragement to you. Yes, sir. Now that you have brought up gospel, preach the gospel, right? We are living in times where we are perplexed. I mean, what is the gospel? We just released a video during Good Friday also uh, conveying that gospel has been marred so much. And few people say, if you have faith and God heals you, you are all right. So then believe in Jesus. Few people say you fight for your rights. Jesus is a revolutionist or something like that. He came down to bring a revolution, especially with shows like Chosen and all of these. They they are they are into that kind of stuff. And we have the New Apostolic Reformation gospel. We have the feministic gospel. We have different kinds of gospels. How do we understand what is the true gospel and how do we preach and present because for us youngsters especially who want to serve the Lord or who want to present the gospel to our friends and witness about Jesus Christ we feel like oh gospel is so boring what do I tell about you know most of my friends or somebody like that they just come and say that okay what do I tell it's about the virgin birth it's about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved is that it or you need to add some elements to it so what is your take on that sir Thank you.